Hello, this is Lady Tehila from the Coven of the Open Mind, and you're watching Wicca and Witchcraft 101. Hail and welcome. The topic this time is evocation. We're starting on chapter six, second half of this series. It's going to be a little bit lighter on the lectures. You're supposed to be outside having experiences. It's the height of the season of life. You cannot learn spirituality and magic from a book. You can learn the theory of it, but you have to get outside into nature and have experiences if of your very own. Find your tools, find your people. That is how you build your spiritual self. So we're going to talk about what kinds of experiences you should be having <laughs> uh, if you want to be a Wiccan witch. Um, the kinds of things that you'll be working on uh, this time of year. You should be working on your spell work, evocation magic. What is that? We'll talk about that today. Uh, we'll talk about how to perform spells, different kinds of spells, protection, uh, how to create sigils using life energy. Uh, that is energy that you generate yourself or that comes from the physical world. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about dark magic and cursing, which we don't do very often in Wicca, but we do. And I'll give you an example because I did it recently. <laughs> and we will also talk about um, enchantments, which is a type of evocation magic that's a little different than spell work, as we shall see. First of all, what is evocation? <laughs> evocation is when you take energy from within yourself of some kind and extend it out of yourself into the world around you. If you're interested in what is physically happening and the metaphysics of that, you can refer back to earlier lectures or whole series on the topic that we have on our channel, and I'll put all of those cards up in the corner. But for the purposes of the second half of the series, I will assume that if you're still watching this series, you have consumed that other content or you have some understanding of what it means to do spell work, to do energy work. Uh, you've been meditating, you've been following along with all of the things that are spelled out in the book. If you don't have it, you can buy a copy. You can find a PDF in our library um, and you should follow along in there as well. Um, read the introductions to the chapters and dwell on uh, what those conceptually mean, form a relationship with them, allow them to influence your dreams, your visualizations, your meditation sessions, go out in nature and have experiences. And then you can form your own idea of what evocation means for you. In general, we consider that evocation is any form of generating energy for the purposes of manipulating the physical world around you okay so you're trying to make a change externally to yourself usually you'll send that energy out in one great burst and it's believed that that's more effective at influencing the world because you know if you think of like a metaphor being water for instance like if there's a drop of water dripping down 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 eventually over time it can wear away something or change the shape of something or have some effect and some kinds of spells may be more effectively done like that things that require commitment over time or that should build up slowly so there are times when you'll do that kind of trickle method and then there are times when you do a burst method that's probably more common especially with life magic and the trickle method is where you just like raise a bunch of energy you physically move your body uh, you get into an altered state of mind you raise the energy you influence the energy you send it out in a big burst uh, because that is more effective like a giant wave more readily washes away obstacles than a trickle right so that's the metaphor, right? That's the idea. There are different kinds of evocation magic. Uh, there's different ways that you can interact with the world uh, and your intent aligns with changing the external world. Uh, spells are the most basic form. This is where you generate the energy just like we've been talking about. We'll refer to that energy as intent and desire. Okay, the intent is the intent to raise the energy and the desire is the energy that's been raised. And then you send that energy out into the world or bring it into yourself or both in order to generate some kind of commitment to that change from both yourself and the world around you. And the world will not commit to your spell if you do not commit to your spell. So you have to be willing to commit and follow it through as well if you want the world to see it through. Enchantments are uh, things that have a determined 
intent, right? The intent is to put energy of some kind into an item. So the desire is up for whatever kind of enchantment you're doing, but the intent is that you're going to put that energy that you raise into the item so that when it comes in contact with your skin or when you're holding it or thinking about it or if you give it to someone, uh, then the energy can be used and um, can bring about some kind of commitment more readily than it would have, um, you know, if you just tried to do that act independently. It can help to have symbols, right? It helps to have physical things. It helps to celebrate milestones. <laughs> and taking time to look back down the hill and see how far you've come. All of these things uh, help a person to be more successful, period. Like that's just psychology. So in magic, uh, in, in witchcraft, we make use of that. You know, we trick ourselves and we, and we, use, um, and we use physical things to help us uh, feel like we have more control and we can influence the world around us. And that helps us do it. And, uh, and so that is a form of belief, right? So that that's a form of faith. That's faith in yourself, faith in empowerment, right? That's Wicca. That's what spells are. That's what enchantments are. Um, we'll talk in a bit in a minute uh, about more how you do it uh, and all of the various details. Right now, just comparing and contrasting the different ways that you can push your energy out into the world. You can either just send it out or you can put it into a thing. Okay. Uh, you can also do what's called binding. We'll talk about that in detail next time, as well as chaos magic a little bit. I'm not going to talk about how to do it so much. It's very advanced. It's not for a one-on-one -on -one series, but, uh, but we'll talk about what it is. And binding, uh, uh, it's basically using external energies to yourself to do spells or enchantments. So if you're working with a consciousness external to your own, and you're working with a type of energy that has consciousness, which can be another person, it can be a ghost, a spirit, it can be an animal, uh, like a non-human animal, like a pet, um, it can be uh, a deity, um, it can be uh, the elements, the fae, uh, some kind of metaphysical energy that manifests for you according to some archetype like that, right? So. You can bind any kind of energy. You can use any kind of energy to do magic. But if you use certain kinds of energy to do magic, you have to contend with their will, the external will, the component of that force that is not you. Because, you know, it is one with you and you are all one process in a sense, but it is also distinct, right? It's both. So we talked about that in the past in the metaphysics go watch that. But for now, all you have to remember is that if you're working with an external energy, an external entity that has consciousness of its own, you have to bind that consciousness to your will. That is more advanced magic. And we'll talk a little bit about it this time and a lot about it next time. Uh, but we won't talk much about chaos, <laughs> which is a form of evocation as well, because it is an expression of will, but it uses non-thinking and non-being. It's very advanced, very complex and dangerous. So we're not going to talk about that one very much. So just remember, spells are entirely self-generated energy. Enchantments have a set intention involving items and bindings and chaos use energy external to the self. Let's talk more about spells. Spells uh, create feedback loops for success. That's really what they are. <laughs> they make it easy to commit to a goal and follow through and see that goal through. There are two kinds of spells, really, two categories. Blessings, which are intended to bring about positive change, and curses, which are intended to cause harm. And some people will define their spells by their outcome. So if something was meant to be a blessing but it caused harm, they may relabel it a curse. Some will just call it a failed blessing and they'll note that it brought harm and what kind of harm it brought. And then if they try to do a similar spell again, they'll look at that and be like, hmm, maybe I should do something a little different this time. <laughs> so that'll be how different people look at that. Most spells are simple expressions of desire. They're really just, this is what I want. I can see it happening. I want it. <laughs> and um, when you surround that with intent and you meticulously plan for it and you do absolutely everything in your power 
to you would invest all of your energy in it that makes it a manifestation that brings it into creation so that your dream comes true okay so the uh, the intent is where it starts, but sometimes it starts with desire. And that's why it's like intent and desire go hand in hand. They're like two sides of one. They're almost like the air and water component of the spell. And they're just like two halves of one thing. And one of them is like, okay, I can see it and I think I know what I want. And the other is I feel it and I know this is what I want. Um, and for many people who are Wiccan, that desire doesn't always come about until they're in the crux of the spell. Like even, even right up until they're doing the spell, they're like, am I sure I want this? Am I sure that this is, that I know what I want? And then once they do the spell, then they're sure. Because a lot of Wiccan witches need the alignment with divinity to be sure. And that comes from the ritual state of mind, like we talked about last time. Okay, so the main component of a spell is the process of raising energy. And then directing that energy deliberately with a specific purpose in mind. And that is the essence of magic. That is the essence of witchcraft. So let's talk about the spell logistics. First of all, are you going to use a burst or are you going to use the trickle method? So think about the nature of the spell being done. Is there a great need to influence a great many threads? <laughs> um, the more that you burst it out, the more threads of the tapestry that weave together and form creation will you influence. And even if you just subtly influence the weaving of a thread, they'll all weave together differently and suddenly the tapestry picture is different, right? So there's always that component of like uh, chaos within all magic. It's like you're working with deity or demons, you're working with manifestations of order or disorder right but all of it in an effort to bring about some change in the ordered world oftentimes it will be directed through what's called like a cone of power it's visualized as being like sitting on top of the um uh, some will visualize their circle as being like a cylinder and then the deity can come down into the cylinder from above, uh, you know, very readily into the self. And then they'll, if they're putting energy out, visualize it like a cone on top that they can like sh throw the energy out and, and maybe the cone even will like shift and curve and like point in um, whatever direction they want the energy to go in. Sometimes they'll visualize the energy being received by the target, whatever that is. Um, and the cone of power is like sometimes seen as being like just a cone and the energy shot up and then comes back, falls back down to earth or something. Sometimes it's seen as being like a tornado, <laughs> you know, that like is like curvy and loops around and hooks on like some kind of Dr. Seuss book. I don't know. <laughs> There's different ways to visualize how that energy gets sent out. Uh, some people will just visualize the energy going out in every direction, like an actual explosion that bursts their circle outwards. Okay, but if you're using the cone of power, if you're using that, that's the burst technique. And you're going to do that when you want... Um, the energy to last uh you don't let's say you don't care how long it lasts let's say you're just like okay i need this to be done and then it's done i need to come true within a, the next month within a fortnight within a moon okay so then you just burst the energy out you have this big need you burst it out everything's affected everything's impacted everything slowly falls into place threads weaving together and thus the tapestry forms the image you had in your mind and your will has manifested into existence. That's the burst method. If you don't care <laughs> how big the reach is, say because it's like a personal shield or something you keep up all the time that's just close to you and meant to protect you in, this here, in the here and now, then you'll want to use the trickle method. You'll want the energy to be constantly going out, constantly maintained, um, but you, you know, and you want to be committed over time, but you don't care if it goes out and influences everyone else around you or brings some grand vision in your mind into manifestation, right? What you're trying to manifest in the case of like a personal shield or, you know, uh, a spell for health and wellness is personal to you. So a trickle method makes more sense then because you could just enchant a candle or create a sigil or create a ward and then make use of that same mechanism again and again, repowering it and making it stronger so that it's just a reflex. It's a habit to protect yourself, right? Shielding is really the process of making good habits, <laughs> right? It's the process of being a disciplined, mindful person so that when you interact with the world, 
those interactions can't hurt you. That's what shielding is. So we'll talk about shielding in a minute. But um, that's a form of trickle spell work. Okay, so those are the two different kinds. Now, is an altered state of mind required for spells? Some people will say no, but truly the answer is yes. The only time it might be no is if you're working on a sigil that you've already created in the past in an altered state of mind and you're just calling that energy to present or opening and you know so if you consider that to be spells or cord cutting right so some people will enchant it and do all of the work in one go and then later they'll come back and just cut a piece of it or tie a knot in it then they'll say no i don't need an altered state of mind to do that that's right that's a trickle spell you needed the altered state of mind to start the spell off but then you can make use of it without the altered state of mind in the future that's the point of a trickle spell <laughs> that it's easy to keep it up and maintain it because you put in a little bit of effort initially and then it's done and then you just feed it okay <laughs> so truly to be successful an altered state of mind is required uh, at least to get the spell started a magical or ritual trance um, um, magic is really the art of aligning the physical emotional and spiritual selves so you have to know yourself to bring yourself into alignment you have to know what you're feeling you have to know if you have doubts you have to know if there's some cosmic reason why what you're doing isn't meant to be and you have to be willing to accept that if it is the case there's a degree of mindfulness and detachment required to do successful magic otherwise it just can breed delusion it can make you think that it's working when it's not people get caught up in things that are really just the placebo effect and not more than that like magic really is more than just the placebo effect it is it does make use of the placebo effect it makes use of psychology but it's more than that it's about bringing commitment from the universe and from yourself and meeting the universe halfway and achieving that alignment requires you to do the work to be a disciplined, mindful person, and that requires an altered state of mind. So focus has to be also completely on this particular spell, especially in today's day and age. People's focus is constantly split. So an altered state of mind is the way to be sure that on every level of your being, you are focused on this working. You have this image in your mind of what you want to see and it's surely going to come to pass because it's all your energy in that moment focused on this one thing. Any distractions at all can detract from the purpose and it can weaken the spell. And, and, and so can doubt or disbelief. So some people, that's why they don't tell others when they do magic because they're afraid of people not believing them after. And that's valid that can happen. If you are the kind of person to care if other people believe you and you feel like you have to prove yourself, then if you do spell work, often it's better to just not even tell them about it. <laughs> um, okay, and that's why you'll see in all of the spells all over our Tumblr and any spell I've ever published in our encyclopedia is lock the doors, close the blinds, those are the first two lines, that's the start of every spell. <laughs> Make sure no one can distract you. First part of every spell, cast a really good circle so you can't be distracted by the things outside of it. That's part two. We're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so here's some more spell logistics, right? So secrecy and spells we just touched on. Some care more than others about how they're seen and whether people believe them. And be honest with yourself, okay? It's not who you wish you were. It's who you really are. Does it bother you when other people don't believe what you're capable of? Are you the kind of person whose self-worth is tied to how others perceive of you? Whether or not you should be like that, if you are like that, don't tell people about your magic. Just do the magic. Keep it to yourself. Your spirituality is for you, okay? It's not for other people. It's not to prove. You don't have anything to prove. You're doing the spell because it makes you feel better. It helps you be committed to your goals. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Especially when you're new to magic, this is a factor. So do not be afraid to keep your spells secret. Even from people that you know do magic. Even if you're just like, no, this is for me. This is personal. I don't want to share that I did this. You may tell someone, I did a spell for this. And then they're like, oh, what'd you do? And you'd be like, eh, I don't want to talk about it it's my it's it's my it's for me when it comes true maybe I'll let you know later you know maybe I'll publish it someday do it okay you have permission <laughs> you have permission to keep some of your craft private you do and you should and that is a wicked thing to do in this era of the internet it, it should be it must be said sadly that you have permission but you do telling others by the way hearing them doubt you that can make you doubt yourself then the spell will not succeed. You cannot doubt yourself. You cannot doubt your magic. You have to know it will come true. Write it in your book of shadows. That's why you have a book of shadows. It's like your 
you know, your book of shadows is almost like a person. It's like, <laughs> that's your journal, right? It's like Tom Riddle's diary. You're writing to a version of you. <laughs> okay. Divine alignment. What does it mean to align with divinity? What does it mean that your physical, emotional, and spiritual selves are aligned, right? So in Wicca, we'll say deity has the ultimate trump card. So if there's some crucial information that you're not aware of, you cast a spell, you're waiting and waiting, a moon goes by, another moon, still nothing has come to pass, maybe you have to sit back and think, okay, did I do something wrong with my spell? No, I really felt like it was going to work. So maybe there's some divine reason why it's taking longer, why it's not working. For many people, that's a good time to consult their divination tools or to try to have visions of communicating with divinity, have some sign. It, this That would mean that there's some misalignment between you and divinity that makes it like, okay, well, I don't really know what's good for me, I guess. <laughs> so that is, it, that is a signal. If your spells are not working, it's not, oh, I've got a bad spell. Oh, I, I, okay, well, maybe you did. Maybe you looked up a spell and you didn't put much energy into it and you just did what someone told you. And yeah, then it's not going to work. Okay, that's not magic. Magic is the act of doing investing energy in something so that you will be committed to it right so you have to it's it's a personal thing you can't just look up a spell look up a process and do what somebody else said you can look up a recipe for ingredients for things and stuff like that I posted one last night but you know then you have to make it your own then you have to do it so the relationship with divinity protects you that's why Wiccans work with deity because if you go to do a spell and it's just not going to be good for you it's going to cause harm or something. And you don't necessarily even know that. Your deities will know that. Like your, your, the part of you that is aligned with divinity will know that. And will halt the spell before it could go to pass. Or change the way that it manifests. Um, and if you need it to go a very specific way. And you're really sure that that's exactly how it goes. Use extremely specific wording and make it so. And that is how you can be sure that all of your spells will be wholly beneficial to you. Especially deity will get in the way if the spell is going to hurt someone else and you're like Wiccan and you've spoken oaths that you'll never harm someone and then you go to do a spell that would hurt someone. So that can be a time that um, that the spell will not come to pass as well. If it'll inv invalidate your principles, um, it'll fail even if you don't know why. So that's why we write it in our books of shadows and keep track of it and work on being more concise next time and more specific and having a better understanding of all the facts next time so that our spells can be successful in the future. Willful delusion is the key component <laughs> to spell work, uh, really. Uh, it's the altered state of mind. And then you do something, you distract yourself. And the distraction um, allows you to, it confounds the senses. It's, it, you, it allows you to believe that what you're seeing in your mind's eye is physically real, which makes it easier to interact with, makes it easier to influence. Um, and it makes it easier to bring about the aligned state of being because deity is outside of time and reality. The elements are outside of time. In order to have an understanding or relationship with them even, it requires some suspension of belief. Um, there are songs in Wicca that say things like, um, you know, uh, why does nobody ever ask like, the question, why do you believe it? You believe it in your dreams, okay? You believe it in your dreams. <laughs> Why not in waking world? So that is what the uh, mind alteration is for. It's to bring about the state of willful delusion. And dissociation is sometimes used in magic. It's less common. It's used for something called metamorphosis that we talked about in chapter three. That was a past lecture. We won't cover them in this because it's really advanced and I will only work. If you think you're the kind of person who should be working with those techniques, either because you don't have it a choice because you have a disorder or because um, you're that advanced and you just need like then you need a one-on-one -on -one mentor and you can feel free to email me and reach out to me but it's not for a one-on-one -on -one course so we're going to just skip over dissociation here and the techniques that have to do with dissociation and just talk about delusion right so the the, the willful uh, alteration of your state of mind so that you can physically see what's happening so that it feels extremely real so that you walk away from the experience with no doubt in the success of it and that brings about the sense of knowing and that sets everything into motion and that brings about the commitment because it's easy to be committed to something when you're like no no this is going to happen I can see it in my mind and it's happening. Now I just have to prepare for it. 
<laughs> and that makes it easier to prepare. See, and that's, and that is very straightforward. Visualization is involved here as well. Visualization is when you see the outcome in your mind's eye. Uh, some people have more trouble with this than others, but if you can, you should visualize the outcome so strongly that you can literally see it in your mind. You can see every part of it. Uh, you can't just, you know, see a generic version. It has to be so specific. You can see specifically what is going to happen, where it's going to happen, um, or you can visualize the energy around you if that's easier. You can see it as static or moving light. And you can fixate on the desire of the spell using some form of visualization, some form of controlled delusion. Uh, ordering the altar and the whole ritual space according to the purpose of the ritual is really helps you to to see in your mind's eye what you want to see uh, so that's why we make use of associations like incense and items and lighting and decorations altar cloths everything in the space uh, your attire everything should be planned out and intentional highly ordered that is what a life energy based space looks like which is primor primarily what Wiccans will make use of in their rituals, highly ordered spaces. Um, and then things like physical motion can help, right? So as above, so below, right? So use your body to generate energy physically, and then you can see that energy coming into the room around you and being generated, and you can feel it as heat, right? And, and static, if there's multiple people, especially it has this transcendent sense to it, and you get goosebumps and you feel alive, right? That raising of energy while in an altered state of mind, and the tools can help you do this as well, right? Focusing on the right kind of energy even while you alter your state of mind. And then doing a distracting symbolic action as above, so below, right? So it's sympathetic magic, it's life magic. Doing some kind of symbolic act that allows for you to really experience the delusions as if they weren't yours, as if they just happened. They come from you and they come from the energy coming down into you if you've invoked energy, which we talk about invocation in the next chapter. But when you distract yourself from that fact, it feels external to yourself and you can interact with it like it's external to yourself. And that gives you a window of insight. It's kind of like a detachment from the self, which many religions preach brings wisdom. Okay, so distract yourself with symbolism. Distract yourself, right? Symbolic acts, they distract you from the mundane nature of the ritual, the fact that you're really just dancing around in a room with a robe on, right, with all your friends. Like, you know, looking at it from a distance, it if you didn't understand what was going on, if you couldn't feel the energy, which most people can't, even people that don't believe in magic can see uh, a ceremony, a religious ceremony being done and feel like, oh, this has meaning. This has significance. They can feel that because it does to the people doing the, the working, you know, but if there was no meaning, it would be a completely ridiculous thing to do, <laughs> right? So that's the point, right? So distract yourself from that fact. It's not ridiculous. It's symbolic. It's, it's not just words on a page. It's poetry, right? It has meaning. It has inherent value. It contains beauty. It contains order and is the manifestation of will. And that is what makes it powerful. That is the power of it, right? The fact that it is just a nonsense action that becomes transcendent because you believe that it is transcendent. That's the power of religion, of belief, of all of this. Everyone has that power. Everyone has it and anyone can make use of it at any time. Lots of people feel like they have to go into a church and let someone else do it and they don't even feel the power. That's sad to me. <laughs> you need to feel this power. It's so beautiful. Find a way to feel the power. In Wicca, we do it with witchcraft. Okay, so we would use sprinkling powder into shoes or onto the ground to ward or curse or banish, uh, using spell bottles for similar purposes, placing them in the ground or somewhere where someone will see it or somewhere where someone will spill it and it'll smell and be nasty or something. Um, strewing herbs or papers around a space. That's often more common. That reinforces an energy. Uh, it's more positive and more life-based. Lighting, engraving candles, candles that represent, serve as a focal point for the raised energy, right? Fire generates energy. We generate energy via our fire component. So that's the metaphor. 
crafting symbols that can continue to carry the intent, uh, you know, even if the desire is sort of raised over time, the emotions come over time and reinforce that intent. Uh, you can brew potions. So we just did yesterday. You can brew potions that you can pour on yourself or strew about a space. Uh, you can use it for a later date, charge it up, use it for trickle spells, you know, use it in a pinch. So I just made this potion because I don't have time to think about whether or not my home is going to be full of chaos. I'm going to go around with that potion and just sprinkle it everywhere and go get myself a new bell and consecrate it and just be ringing the bell and sprinkle this purification potion on everything. I'm moving to a new home. <laughs> it's chaos. <laughs> so I've made a trickle spell. I've made a potion. I made something I can continue to make use of without having to put more energy into it, <laughs> without having to put work into it or get into an older state of mind because I don't have time. <laughs> that is when you make use of trickle spells. Perfect example. Okay, so you can see that in the shorts, by the way, if you're interested. So the action taken in the spell should motivate the commitment to come. Right. So whatever you're doing for the spell, the act must be symbolic of doing that in real life. OK. All right. Now, color symbolism, very big in spell crafting. You may select uh, one of a color for one of these reasons. You may select a color because of some chakra alignment, especially if you're doing some kind of healing. Uh, they'll look here and you'll see the similarities between these associations and the chakra color associations are very close so that's not by accident probably so uh, we all have similar conceptions of what all the different colors mean um, in Wicca you know pink love friendship relationships uh, open-mindedness empathy with red you have vitality battle passion grounding orange creativity reproductive sexual health yellow you have energy self-confidence self-love will and motivation that's your tummy chakra yellow lines with the energy the generation right it's the sun uh, then you've got green which represents money and abundance and wealth and non-romantic love right so the wealth right Re wealth of any form including family and hearth blue is healing avoidance of uh, battle peace communication purple leadership mysticism divination wisdom white purification divinity spirit work and multi-purpose use you can use it pretty much any of these things because white contains all the other colors and then black some people will say that about black as well because the pigments include all the other pigments but some people think white because it's a representation of divine light and white light contains all the other anyway whatever however it makes sense to you but most people will use black for banishing binding um, divinity and spirit work you can see uh, an example of purification and banishing magic in our shorts that I just did using a black candle and um, and that we just did recently so check it out words of power are another key component to spells the words are whatever you speak to seal the deal and another name for the words of power is incantation uh, it's a poem of some kind that captures the spells intent so you plan it in advance and then you use it to make sure that the energy you're raising goes to that intended purpose Incantation should be poetic, uh, emphatic, dramatic, evocative. Uh, really get into it. Uh, don't be afraid to like pull a little actor stuff out. I'm not a, an actor. I'm a singer, so I do a lot of singing in my rituals. But some people will really play up the drama instead because they're not as big on singing or something. Make use of metaphor, symbolism. It doesn't have to rhyme. It does have to be poetic, dramatic, in fact, all the other qualities of a poem. <laughs> and it should feel flowy. It should come out of you naturally, and it should feel like an expression. You do not have to memorize it. Uh, I'm notoriously bad at memorizing things. Uh, so I always bring my book in with me. It's way less stressful for me to just have it in front of me and look at it. The book serves as a focal point for me in terms of knowing where my intent came from. Uh, so that's a big part of helping me keep track of my intent. Uh, so I love the symbolism of holding a book. Even if you don't have to look at it, I would still write it in a book and bring the book in. Um, but yes, many people will use very short, uh, easily chanted, easily repeated phrases. Um, so the one we used yesterday was just letting go, banished be, as we do will, so mote it be easy to remember because I can't remember anything and we just chanted it again and again building up the energy while we were drumming until we sent the energy out in a burst 
Some people will use longer invocations uh, that are maybe more highly ordered or more poetic. So an example of a higher of a longer incantation or actually an invocation is the charge of the goddess, right? So they will use something like that. That's an incantation, as in something designed to be evocative as opposed to invocative. Um, that's what an incantation is. And they'll pay attention to the number of syllables on each line. They'll make sure it's highly ordered, particular about how it flows. If it's long, they may just read it once at the end or the beginning of the spell, depending on how they're doing it. And trickle spells may not make use of words of power or incantations at all. So there's a lot of uh, variety. Some common things that you'll hear that you'll hear people put into their spells um, by the power of the elements, uh, by the power of the elements five, or by the power of the elements four, by the will of the Lord and Lady, in perfect love and perfect trust, <laughs> and uh, as I do will, so mote it be. All of these things are very commonly found. Uh, it, it, it's going to commonly be a tuplet or at least end in a tuplet. And even the longer incantations that you just read once, sometimes you'll still chant the last two lines. Um, and you know, another example could be these words be spake in rhyme, rhyme times three and nine times nine. You know, stuff like that. Uh, it'll be you know things that seal the deal. That's the idea with the words of power. Things that are like, I have spake it in rhyme, so it shall be so. You know, and my will, so mote it be. Right? So that's what the words of power are for. Okay. Then you'll record it in your book of shadows. And that is kind of like a ledger <laughs> for some witches, uh, a journal. They'll write in it and say, you know, I did the spell here on this day. This is the associate, the associations I used. This, these were what the stars were, um, or the relevant parts of the stars. Um, this is what my intention was. This is what I wanted. This is how I visualized everything they might need in order to come back to that spell later and say, okay, I'm going to try the same spell again. It was successful for me last time. Let me see if it works again. Or, hmm, this didn't really work out for me. Maybe I should try it again. What do I tweak? So the more more details you have, the more you can tweak an old spell to make it good to do again. So it just depends on what kind of witch you are. Are you doing the same r spells over and over again and building them up over time? Are you more chaotic like me and you just kind of make something up every time you need to do a spell? That'll all be up to you. But this is why the wisest of witches are often crones, because whether you're writing it in a book or not, Experience is the only way to learn religion, <laughs> so it's, experience is the only way to learn how to be a powerful, empowered being. <laughs> Go out there and um, practice being empowered, and then you will learn many wise things and come back and teach me one day. <laughs> okay. Now, astrology and spellcraft. We did a whole lecture on astrology. Go check that out if you haven't seen it already. But in spellcraft, there's nothing more influential than the moon. Okay, waxing moons bring attraction, beginning, and birth. They bring um, fertility. They they help uh, promote fertility of any kind. So any kind of fertility-based magic, anything designed to bring about bounty, romance, uh, abundance, or a healthier habit, building good habits. That's all waxing energy. The full moon brings creativity. The full moon brings, uh, helps you work with divinity and is a day to celebrate divinity. And it helps with any kind of manifestation. It's easiest to align with divinity on that day. So that's where the manifestation can be easier. And so too can divination come easier because intuition is heightened and your relationship with divinity is just better because you can feel it and see it in the night sky and you can feel her light. That's the full moon. The waning moon is best for banishing, uh, loss, um, losing unhealthy habits, letting go. So that's why we just did a letting go spell and we waited for the moon to start to wane. So we did it on the full, the, the waning full moon. That's the right time. If you're trying to really capture the maximum waning potential, then you do it right then on the full moon, right when it starts to wane. That's the maximum potential for waning energy. Then you get to the dark moon. Eventually it wanes all the way down. You get to the dark moon, purification, renewal, rest, introspection. Some people will curse on dark moons. Some people don't believe in doing magic on dark moons at all. 
Most Wiccans uh, don't do curses very often, but they may do banishing magic or uh, that sort of thing. Chaos magic is very commonly done on full moons, so a lot of witches avoid doing magic on full moons because they just think that the chaos are going to influence their magic and they just don't want any part of that uh, chaos. Um, some people will use it to work with deities or demons less commonly in Wicca. And some people will do magic but pull from the waxing or waning phase. And it's believed that the most potential waning or waxing phase is the crescent, when the moon is new and just starts to appear in the sky again and you can just see a sliver of it. That's the most potential for waxing energy. So a lot of people think that's the most powerful time to do a spell that embodies beginning or cre you know creating or something. So, um, you know, then there are other times when you might do certain kinds of magic. Um, so each day of the week is ruled by a different planet. In classic astrology, you've got the sun on Sunday, the moon on Monday. Then you've got the less, the less obvious ones because we've named our days after the Germanic gods. Um, but Tuesday is ruled by Mars or two. Uh, Wednesday is ruled by Mercury or, or Odin. Um, Thursday is ruled by Jupiter, Thor's day, right? Friday, Freya day, right? So Venus and Saturday by Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and Ceres align with Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter. They double up uh, and they have similar energy, but the slower moving planets are with regard to the collective consciousness or unconsciousness. So they double up in the sense that you can also derive what the higher planets mean by understanding the inner planets workings and then just extrapolating that to us as a whole human unit. The archetypes of divinity have associations with the elements, uh, with aspects of nature, um, when the planets transition and what day of the week it is, right? So that's what we've just been talking about. And the, then there's all the different ways that witches may determine when to do a certain spell. It's going to be based on what deities they work with, what deities they want to call for this particular spell, what days those deities celebrate, what energies those deities embody, what energy they need for the spell. Um, it's really they want an investment from divinity to match their investment. So they're going to look into astrology and look into uh, archetypes of deity and find a way to make sure that that aligns will come because they're doing it at the right time to make use of whatever energy it is they're trying to raise or use or you know in nature whatever the case may be for their spell so the process for creating a spell first of all you want to ground and center which can also be called a tuning okay push everything out of your mind focus on what it is you're doing in the task at hand then clearly define the intent of the spell and be as specific as possible. Many people will just write a journal entry or stream of consciousness, right? Or just get it all out on paper, somehow draw something, get their, their emotions out in, in the open, and then think about how do I express this emotion in the most ordered way possible? And that will come down to what associations do you use? Uh, do you use particular deities, particular crystals? Uh, do you hold them? Do you balance them on your head? Do you put them on a wand? Uh, do you make use of incense? What kinds of incense? What kinds of candles? What other tools are you going to hold or look at? How, what is the altar going to look like? All of that will be based around the intent and it will help bring about the desire on the deeper levels of your being when you're in circle, in the altered state of mind, and you want to experience that intent as desire as well. Then you'll determine when the spell should be done so that you'll have the optimal alignment with energies external to yourself. Is it a waxing, waning, or full moon kind of spell? Is it based on the other astrological or numer numerological associations? You'll write the words of power. It'll usually be two to four rhyming lines with equal syllables. Sometimes it'll be longer. Sometimes you won't use them at all. <laughs> so that step is optional. Then once you do the spell, you're going to record it in your book of shadows. You'll record it beforehand so that you can refer to it within ritual if you need to. You'll gather all the supplies. You'll cast circle, which we're about to talk about protection magic in more detail, but you should be able to cast circle by now. You should know that basic amount of protection magic because that's what we talked about when we learned how to push our energy out of ourself in chapter three when we talked about metaphysical centers. So raise the energy using some physical action that expresses your soul and allows you to forget yourself to just forget your physical mundane self. 
you feel totally expressed, totally aligned with the higher planes of existence. And then when you're done and it comes to fruition, jot down what happened in your book of shadows so you can look back at it and use that spell again. So that's the process of creating and doing a spell. Different kinds of spells, protection spells. Okay, so protection, magic. What is a shield? What does it mean to cast circle? It means that we are investing our energy in a particular state of mind, uh, a lack of awareness of harmful ideas or harmful intentions, such that a happy and healthy state of mind can be maintained. And we, when we say shielding, we usually mean doing that constantly in daily life. But when we say cast circle, it's the same thing. We want to be in a space where we're not aware of or distracted by things happening outside the circle. Often people will still be aware of it, not always, but it's not distracting. They don't have any interest in looking at it. They're just like, oh, that's happening, if they can see it at all. And that is the nature of a hard shield, which we'll talk about the different kinds of shields. So shields are just a way of pushing your energy out into the space around you so that everything in that space is something you're already aware of, that, that is meant to be there and ordered, that is not distracting. You're completely focused on what you're doing, and that allows you to get into a deep, altered state of mind to do things that maybe you would otherwise have inhibitions about and, um, and to just use your body, use your soul, and manifest your will into creation. So shielding is technically a spell. It's a spell where the intent is safety and protection. Uh, and this can mean different things, right? So this, you could have physical security that's tied to your hearth and home. It could be personal space, being respected by people, feeling well and having wellness. You can have emotional or mental security, so you can be immune to influence. Um, you can be less susceptible to pessimism or influence from other people who maybe don't have as good an outlook on life. Um, you can be looking for spiritual wellness, protecting you from entities that don't mean well, ghosts or things that make you afraid, or you know, if you're particularly scared of demons or you've you know, had bad experiences with hauntings, then maybe you wanna just shield and keep all of that out because you're like, no, no, I don't even care if the ghost is a kind spirit that means well i don't want to know about it at all right so there's reasons why you may keep out anything that could be overwhelming to you some combination of this is what most people shield for <laughs> so shields are very personal they're kind of spell they require energy like all spells and they can be charged up but that charge will diminish in time to keep shields up for longer, uh, people can anchor them to things that also generate energy of a type of a certain vibration. So like crystals or metals, uh, jewelry is common, things that they, they might pull the energy from an external source, which can be dangerous um, because the elements of nature, <laughs> Uh, you know, the elements like the sun and these things are representations of forces that are external to yourself that have a consciousness that is difficult to understand or contend with as a mortal being. And when you bind their energy, if you're, if you're using it in ways that they don't approve of or you're using a lot of it or you're being greedy or, you know, you're also littering, throwing cigarette butts on the ground while you pull out their energy, it can result in you winding up you know, getting latched onto you by some external energy it manifests through you into something that can be more harmful. And we'll talk about that mechanism in the next one when we talk about bindings gone wrong. <laughs> but um, for the most part, shielding is very safe. If you're trying to anchor your shield and you are not sure, just use crystals, use metals, use jewelry, use enchantments. That is the safest way to go about anchoring uh, your shielding and uh, in order to keep the shields up longer. And people do that because, uh, you know, the, having a ward is something that you can just rely on. So wards are shields which are bound to physical items. Um, the item itself should be evocative, like we said, like a metal or, or a crystal or a set of crystals. And on the previous slide, there's a list of the best crystals uh, for shielding, which are mostly black and red and yellow, things that align with the lower chakras, the evocative chakras. Um, but some higher, uh, higher resonance ones too, like sodalite, lapidolite, amethyst. Um, uh, quartz is one that's really a universal kind of, uh, that's just very good for all kinds of evocations, including protection. Uh, so wards are identical to shields. 
um, in every way, except that when you create them, there's like an additional step to lock that energy into the item. Uh, and that's a form of enchantment, which we will talk about at the end of this lecture here in just a minute. So there's one additional step in award. Otherwise, it's basically the same thing as a shield and you'll lock it into a crystal or a piece of jewelry, something you wear or carry with you or hold or set up in some ceremonious way in your home on a permanent altar, whatever the case may be, so that it can allow you to feel that protection to quickly enter an altered state of mind that's centered around the intent and desire of protection if you need to because when you're in moments where you feel threatened you panic <laughs> and you may not be ready to just cast a spell but if you have a ward then you don't have to do that work again right so a ward is a type of trickle spell it's a trickle shield <laughs> if you will <laughs> that's why you use some kind of evocative anchor um, to power it now there are really four different kinds of shielding techniques, four categories, and then there's any number of ways that you can visualize or go about shielding. But the four categories are, I call them porous, okay, so you allow some energy through, so like a sponge, right, some things get stuck in the sponge, some things go through, and it's often visualized as feathers or webs or leaves or nets, uh, and the bad energy doesn't come through at all. So you may be aware, you may be unaware of people's bad intentions. You may be flying blind, right? You may wind up in a bad place because someone meant ill and you could have known about it, but you couldn't because your shield is keeping that energy out. Why would you want to use this kind of shield then? Well, oftentimes people with bad intentions, their intentions never hurt us. But being aware of those intentions could hurt us. <laughs> Just knowing those intentions exist can be hurtful to some people. So those kinds of people may want to just be like, I don't want to know. If it comes to affect me, I'll deal with it. But if it doesn't affect me, I'm better off not knowing about it at all. And that's the kind of person that will use a porous shield. The filtered shield is when all the energy comes through, but it's sort of stripped of its negative intent. So you kind of have a detachment to it. And uh, it's often visualized as like cloth or a classic filter, like, uh, you know, like in a water bottle or in a fish tank. And all the energy that comes through doesn't affect you. It comes in and you can see it all, but it doesn't affect you. And you can kind of pick and choose what energy winds up affecting you or only the good energy affects you, but the bad just sort of sits there and you have a detachment to it. Um, and that and that's sort of the way that a filtered shield will work you're still aware of it and that's why if you're the kind of person that can't really detach from the knowledge of something then that may not work for you but if that does work for you then it also allows you to be aware of people that maybe are plotting against you, you know, in a way that doesn't affect you but does allow you to prepare for it then there are the, and those are the ones most commonly used for daily personal use. They're easy to bring up. They're easy to maintain. They don't require a lot of energy and they don't close you off completely from the world. The specialized shields, the first one here, the hard shield completely closes you off from the world. Nothing in, nothing out. That is the classic circle. Um, it is used to create sacred space because when you're in that space, you are timeless. You're unaware of the world around you uh, necessarily so that you can do the magic successfully. In order to be unaware of everything around you, cast a hard shield and that will prevent you from even seeing it or from being distracted by it um, because it's just you don't care about anything mundane in the world around you. Um, and this can be visualized as uh, a sphere, cylinder, barrier, bubble of some kind. Some people use mirrors because they imagine the energy bouncing back to whoever cast it at them. So if you're using this as a defective, as a pretensive, so if you're using this as a defensive measure, you could just like make it, visualize it like a mirror and cast it out quick and allow their intentions to bounce back at them and then take it down so that it, it can be called upon protectively on the fly, but it's not going to be kept up all the time because you'd be flying totally blind. You'd have no influence over the world around you either because you're just in your own little bubble. So that usually does not benefit anyone to be in a little bubble all the time. The other kind of shielding technique is something that's called invocated or evocated. This is the kind of shielding technique that is made use of most commonly by people that shield without knowing it. 
okay? Shielding by proxy, <laughs> shielding by transformation and alignment. So it's often, if you are doing it deliberately, it's visualized as tangential lines or tentacles, some kind of appendage that goes out and meshes into the world around you and morphs into reality so that you are a part of your surroundings. And the energy as you send it out becomes your surroundings and just it influences it very effectively because it's not perceivable as being any different than the energy that was already there. And when the energy comes in, it transforms into your own energy before you receive it. So you have to really know yourself to know if something coming in is yours or not yours. And the benefit of doing it that way is it means that everything that comes in is going to be turned into something that you can relate to and understand that you gain some meaning from. Um, and, and that will like reduce ambiguity and confusion. It makes you more aligned with spirituality and more aligned with people around you. It's a, it's a sort of practice of empathy as well. And it's very common to find empaths doing invocated shielding and not knowing it. You also find people doing evocated shielding without knowing it. And evocated shielding is when you're sending your energy out into the world and, and influencing people. So the most powerful shield I ever met was a friend who I joined my first coven with. Um, and she was my roommate as well. And she was like, I just can't like see visions I can't visualize energy. I just don't understand what you're even doing when you do these things. She was totally closed off. So what we found out is that she's shielding so powerfully that she can't be aware of the true nature of existence. She can't see past the veil. She can't have visions. She couldn't use divination tools. So I helped her learn how to bring down that hard shield and put it up again. And then she could start interacting with the world deliberately and having visions when it suited her. But the other thing that she was doing is that she was sending her energy out and influencing everyone around her. So like if she would go to walk down some dark alleyway somewhere and someone was going to mug her, that person would just choose to walk past it, choose to walk a different way, not see her, right? So invisibility comes from this idea that you can influence another person and just be unnoticeable to them. And she was doing that all the time without knowing it because she was a very very skilled evoker very good with magic i think she's actually a star seed as well or something like that or of the fae which have have meanings and wicca we'll talk about another time but so she was doing evo an evocated shield without realizing it and by the time her energy got into the mind of a would-be criminal you know they couldn't tell the difference because they're not mindful or self-aware. So they just think in their head, uh, I'm going to go get some fried chicken and they go some different way. Right. And they don't even know where that impulse came from, but it came from her. And that's amazing, right? That's an incredible thing that people can do. That requires a crazy amount of energy. She was chronically exhausted all the time, sometimes struggling with psychic vampirism, which we'll talk a bit more about next time. But she had complete control over her own fate. And with the invocated technique, you have complete control over your own mindset, which for some people is critical to their health and wellness, <laughs> especially people who tend to have faith and believe in external divinity. Uh, it's necessary for them to make use of some kind of invocated shield because with invocated shielding, the energy is coming into the self from the world. Awareness is heightened. So you're ready to move, to get out of the way, to do what is required to keep yourself well to keep your faith intact, to keep your shield intact. And it's an incredibly difficult technique to do deliberately, which is why you find so many Christians wind up with like demon possessions because they should be relying on this invocated shielding, but they're not very good at their religion. And that means that they're vulnerable, right? But nobody taught them how to like truly have faith or what it means to truly have faith. So then they're vulnerable, right? But so that's not a flaw in the Christian religion that's a flaw of the church right like the the teachings are there they it's just difficult for m many people to have there's all distributions of intelligence and it's difficult for some people to understand the abstract the the religious notions naturally and they ha and they have to find ways to relate to it and find metaphors that work for them and that's why there are so many religions and there's so many different ways to do things so that's all fine but that's the four different kinds of shielding techniques um and the last two invocated and evocated are the same but opposite so that's all the techniques so what type of shielding 
do you use, <laughs> right? What type of shielding is for you? Well, I've made a couple of questions here that might be able to help point you in the right direction of what to try and what to think about. Basically, are you more comfortable existing in your own space or do you prefer to share space with others? You don't like to be alone. Okay, so that'll be one of the two questions. And the other is, are you more comfortable sensing everything around you, even if it's not relevant, uh, even if it might be harmful to know about it, would you still prefer to know versus not know and not be distracted by it and not waste energy, any energy thinking about it, right? So that's the second question. So how you answer those two questions will point to what kind of shielding technique might be the easiest or come most naturally to you. So you can take a look at doing that little quiz. Feel free to put it in the comments if you're interested in confirming if you think that works or not after you've given these techniques a try. Now, the last thing to talk about when it comes to shields is how to make use of more than one shield at a time, which is definitely the most common way that they are used in spell work, in evocation magic. Shields serve a critical function because you can't allow other people's energy into yourself. So I'm probably going to share exactly this same slide at the end of the next one and you'll be like oh okay for now just remember that you'll use different types most commonly for different levels of your shield network and mastering shielding really it doesn't just mean oh i've got a personal shield up and it's the best and nothing gets through that's not supposed to that's good but mastering shielding means that you can push out your energy in various ways in different ways to varying degrees all at the same time with control and precision and you just tear it and you'll say okay my inner sanctuary that's an evocated shield right that's my energy going out and that's it nothing comes in and then you have the inner shield that is porous or filtered. That's where I'm going to gather up my intentions, my energy, my desire comes out of my evocated shield into this inner shield. Okay, now I'm going to send it into this outer inner shield, which is porous or filtered. And that's where I'm going to also gather any energy that I'm using for the spell that's external to myself because I don't want to bring it in. So I have an inner shield that only goes out. And then I have an inner shield <laughs> that <laughs> stores my energy and intent so that it builds up and I don't get exhausted. And then I have an outer inner shield to store energy that I draw to the space so it's nowhere near myself. And then there's the hard outer shield that contains everything so that you don't get exhausted. So that you can build it up and then send it all out. And when you do the spell, you send it out in a burst and that breaks all the shields, but the energy is only going outward. So it doesn't matter that the shields break because none of the energy is brought in. And then you have to ground and center. Then you have to ring a bell. Then you have to go walk barefoot outside and do techniques that you know, bring you back into yourself that replenish you without requiring you to draw energy in because you just sent it all out and you don't want to draw anything in. So that is uh, how you would make use of this. And we'll, tr we'll talk about that a bit more when we talk about binding because that, is, that step becomes essential if you're using external energy and making use of one of these sh complicated shield networks. So I'm going to show you this exact slide again next time. And next time you'll be like, oh, oh, oh I see why you would do this. For now, just like, okay, I see. Each layer is a different type of shield, and you have to do multiple types at once. Okay, that's how you do shielding. So take that in, and we'll come back to that. Next, let's talk about sigils. Sigils, when they are a type of spell, is uh, where you take some kind of energy, you form a symbol to embody the intent, and then you charge that symbol with energy by enchanting it, really, you're putting the energy into a thing. But in this case, it's a symbol, not a physical object. So sigils are usually still considered a type of spell work. You're charging a symbol that when you dwell upon that symbol brings you that energy later for later use. You're storing it so that you can use it later when you maybe don't have the time or the ability to focus as well. This symbol allows you to get right in the perfect mindset to bring about whatever the commitment is. There are many ways to make sigils. There's many different techniques. There are whole uh, blogs 
that are just about making sigils and using these different techniques. So I won't talk about that here. Um, you can just combine symbols, combine letters, combine runes, um, draw what looks right to you and feels good to you. I just did a sigil recently in our community, so you could join our Discord server and get an example of that. I did a, a sigil magic uh, designed to scare off some people that were harassing our community. <laughs> so you could go see a, a good example of that right now <laughs> in our community. Um, so a circle should be used when you create the sigils, even if you're not generating energy, even if you're doing other versions of them, which we'll talk about next time, you still use a circle because you have to raise energy uh, just to be in the right headspace. You have to be in an altered state of mind to be in the right headspace to write down the right symbol that it has power and does what it's supposed to. And that's why, you know, that's why you want to be in circle because otherwise you can become exhausted by the process of creating the sigil as well, creating the symbol. The circle helps it be something that feels more replenishing than exhausting. Now, once you put the energy into the symbol, once you like feel like that symbol has power to me, and when I think of that symbol, when I draw the symbol, that power comes to me. Once you feel like that's the case, you have to lock it in so you're not just constantly thinking of this symbol and suddenly because you have to memorize the symbol too. So the sigil is not just a symbol. It is also a key. The key is a phrase or an idea or drawing something that is evocative, that puts a person into the same emotional state of whoever raised the energy. When the person who is meant to consume the sigil is external to yourself, you may use binding. You may want to draw their energy to you so that you're sure your sigil will repel them or, or work in whatever way it's supposed to heal them, whatever you're doing. So there are times when sigils cross into binding. In the most basic form, all you do is you raise your own energy, you use intent from that desire. It's sort of like the opposite, where in, with the spell you have intent and you raise desire. With the sigil you have a desire and you use that to, to find the intent and you put the intent into a symbol. And then you raise the energy and get into this emotional state and you really feel that energy and you channel it into the symbol itself and then, when, and then you lock it with the key. You lock it with some idea, some, some phrase that brings about that emotional state immediately once you hear it or see it. And that combined with the symbol is what allows the commitment to follow in the moment when you use it later on. So sigils are really good for transformative spells, um, for anything that they're, they're a form of trickle magic, right? Anything that involves protection, wellness, good habits, anything meant to be done by the unconscious mind, because once you learn the symbol, it'll exist in your unconsciousness and be used by your unconsciousness in the same way that your consciousness uses it. That's like a lucid dreaming technique. It's a psychology trick. So you can use the symbol to protect you when you're asleep or doing some kind of spirit journey or having visions, right? So there's a lot of really beneficial reasons to use sigils. And that's why one of the exercises involves giving sigils a try. So, and again, remember, if another person's, if the sigil's designed to be unlocked by another person, it can be a form of binding. So we'll talk about that in the next one. And designing the sigil could be the entirety of the spell. Uh, and then you could carve it on candles or other pentacles and use it in that vein where it helps align that thing that you've now etched it on so then you could use the sigil like a form of enchantment where you put the in uh, intent and desire into this sigil and then when you write it on the thing that completes the process and that is what um puts the energy into that thing so the commitment is now an enchantment in other words <laughs> so that is another way to use sigils as well okay Initiations and dedications are evocative rituals, okay? These are a type of spell. They involve spell work. They also involve invocation. So they're kind of both, and we'll talk about them in both chapters. In the sense of spellcraft, the intent of an initiation or a dedication is a close bond with another person, a group, a tradition, um, a deity, or an ideal. And the desire is acceptance and empowerment. You want to feel like you belong. You want to feel like you are deserving of the title of which. You want to feel like, um, you know, quite literally the commitment is commitment. You want to feel like you're in the group. You're going to stay in the group. You're a part of a family. Um, it also helps establish readiness. 
It can solidify your sense of achievement or accomplishment uh, and how much you've learned. It's a way of looking back down the hill to see how far up you've come. Uh, it can also just like mark your progress, help you stay committed, right? A dedication is a great way to help you feel committed. Because even if you're like, okay, I dedicated, whew, that was exhausting. I'm going to just take a break and go walk barefoot in the woods for the next two months and watch all of these lectures in a single week at the end of the summer. That's completely fine, okay? If that's what you're doing right now, great. <laughs> because that's magic. That's how, that's how witchcraft works. That's, don't be learning in the summer go live experience life okay so that is when you do the dedication because then you know I'm going to come back to this though I'm definitely coming back to this I dedicated myself to it I'm just going to go have other experiences and then come back to it when I'm ready to understand those experiences through the Wiccan lens and then you get ready for the initiation and for many people the dedication will not be a long period it'll happen within the span of the year and a day right so many people will start learning you know realizing they want to be a witch reading it'll be about a year and then saw when comes they initiate maybe they'll dedicate go a year and then initiate we'll talk more about that when we talk about the differences in different lineages and all the details of initiations and stuff that keeps coming up because it's like that's the driving focus. That's the goal, right? When you get to initiation, you're an acolyte. You're a Wiccan witch. You feel empowered. You can claim the title of witch and everyone respects you as a religious being because you are obviously spiritual. You're obviously religious. Even if they don't understand or can't make sense of your religious beliefs, they can tell that you're a spiritual wise woman, right? A wise man. You're a wise one. That is the point of the initiation ceremony and you should do it even if you're doing a solitary one it's very beneficial once the bonds are formed once the oaths are spoken they can never be broken so like you can be repurposed and reinitiated you can go join other groups but you're never going to leave that past behind it's a part of you what is done is in circle cannot be undone what energies you experience and share cannot be unshared you can't unring a bell so what happens in sacred circle stays in sacred circle. And that's another reason why there's a lot of secrecy involved for many covens, why it's a difficult process. So at the end of this, we'll talk about should you join a coven? How do you join a coven? It's a process. We'll talk about that by the end of this series. For now, let's move on to talking about uh, something that is obviously spell work, dark magic. So some use the phrase black magic some it has kind of racist connotations because a lot of the things that are depicted as black magic often belong to people of color's religious beliefs but um yeah i mean i just use dark magic steer clear of all of that myself but some people are just like die hard no it's black magic if it's ill-intentioned it's black because dark magic can also refer to working with death energy like the dark moon is not seen as evil it just aligns with like spirits and death energy, which we don't make use of most of the time in Wiccan practice, in Wiccan magic. Within Wicca, dark magic is only ever used uh, in self-defense or like in banishing. And it, it looks a lot like stereotypical witchcraft, cauldrons of like bubbling, poisonous, foul-smelling liquids, bits of people, bits of animals. Uh, baneful herbs, uh, witches' bottles are really common, uh, things that involve uh, herbs for banishing. Um, you can find a full list of this in my book. I don't want to go through it because we really don't spend a lot of time cursing people in Wicca. I did a curse recently using sigils, using some of these techniques. You can see it in our server and you can understand the kinds of situations that give rise to that need. But for the vast majority of people, these are herbs you do, don't make use of very often and things you don't do very often when you're a witch, uh, when you're a Wiccan witch. I should say. Um, but yeah, so dark magic, it's really just anything that has ill intentions and you have to be willing to do in real life what you intend for your magic to do. So if you would not kill a person, you can't do a spell that will kill a person. Uh, so that's just something to, to consider. Like, do you even want to think about doing cursing? Or if you ever have a need for it, maybe you just find a mentor and then learn it by proxy because it's just, there's not that much benefit to it and it can be kind of risky a lot of Wiccans don't do it so I mention it I give you more um, uh, I give you more resources in my book than this but I'm really not going to dwell on that instead let's talk about enchantments enchantments are a type of evocation where the intent is set the intent is to put energy into an item the spell is used to raise the energy into the space and then it's directed into the object so the desire varies and that's based around the spell that raises the energy that you're then going to direct the item material should match 
whatever the purpose of the spell is because it helps if they are constructively interfering if the waves align then you get even more vibrations from that item it prolongs the effects it doesn't have to be recharged as often uh, and it can be more effective and now enchanted items should be regularly recharged unless they sometimes are edged with sigils that charge over time right so that's another use of like a trickle spell um, and that's why pentacles can be so powerful but you always want to cleanse the item before you imbue it with energy uh, and you want to uh, if you are making it for another person bind their energy to your space first so that you're sure the item will work exactly as intended for them so we'll talk about that binding component next time uh, and and you'll try this as your first uh, form of binding will actually be uh, to do an enchantment for somebody else. Uh, that's a very good introductory way that's not too risky. The commitment then follows from the use of the item or carrying that item around. And the magic isn't in the item itself, it's in the person who wields it. It's just a symbol of the power that they now possess because you have invested that energy in them or in yourself. The creation and the design of the, of the enchantment, enchanted item should reinforce and work with the energy, uh, the material of the item itself. And that leads us to consecrations. Consecrations are a form of enchantment. Consecrations are done to imbue sacred intent into an item. So the desire is sacred intent. Everything within a circle should have the sacred intent so that you know when you're in there, yes, this is my space. This is my energy. I'm not distracted by any of it. I know all of it is exactly on purpose in the spirit of the ordered working that I'm doing. Uh, and that way, when I go to get into an altered state of mind and make use of these tools, there's nothing that could interfere with me expressing my intent and my desire in the way to re receive the commitment that I'd like to receive. So when you do a consecration, you use oil and you spread it onto the tool from the center out in both directions. And the reason why you do it that way is actually based on like um, principles of like energy healing or like if you're using massage or acupressure to heal someone uh, of some kind of injury or they have some tension in their body, you start in the middle and you work it out in both directions and then you can like pull the tension out by, you know, through their finger, through their toe. So anybody that does any kind of like tension or energy manipulation in terms of like healing a body or massage therapy is going to be like, yeah, yeah, you start in the center and you work to the outsides. That is the same principle that's used in consecration. Some will start at the outsides and work in because it's a physical object, because it's a symbolic act, I don't think it really matters. If it was really a person, I don't know if that would work. <laughs> but, it but it doesn't matter so much <laughs> when it's just a, a symbolic. Uh, and some people will use infused water, infused with herbs that align with purification, um, or infused with just a tiny drop of oil, or infused with uh, like moon, moon water that they've left out in the moon to infuse it with the moon's energy so that the water itself feels sacred. Sometimes they'll use salt water. It depends on the tool that you're cleansing because some tools can handle oil on them, some not, some can handle water, some not. Some will use uh, incense instead if it can't handle any liquid touching it because it's a very like precious tool. So that'll all just depend uh, on the nature of the tool itself and the preference of whoever's doing the consecration. But it's a symbolic act that represents taking any mundane energy out and putting only sacred energy into the tool. And everything on your altar should be consecrated. Most things on the altar should be cleansed. As we talked about last time, there are times where you may not cleanse something because you want that energy to be in that thing, especially if it embodies death energy, right? But that's why you have shield networks, because you would put the death altar in a shield that is outside of your own inner sanctuary. And that way, even if it does draw in some unexpected energy, it doesn't draw it in to yourself. It just draws it into your space and you can look at it and see it and process it and commune with it and decide if that's something you want to bring into yourself or redirect to some other purpose. So that's why everything should be cleansed except for some things. That's why you use shield networks. That is what consecration is. That is what it means. Okay, so this time around the homework, uh, we're in chapter six. Um, we're going to read uh, 190, uh, 197 through 216, uh, which will put us at 
uh, just about halfway uh, through the chapter. Uh, the last section is a lot longer than the first section. It's on binding, and it's longer because binding can be very risky and very dangerous, so there's a lot to communicate on the subject. Um, so it's most of chapter six uh, to read this time in terms of the number of sections. We're going to get started with spell work, writing incantations, um, designing spells, making use of associations, collecting herbs out in nature. Um, there's a really powerful full moon coming on Luthnasa this year, so it's a great time to do magic if you're new to it. Um, you can start by designing a sigil. You can start by enchanting some items. As we talk about binding next time, it'll be even easier to enchant an item on behalf of, an, of another, so make sure you come back for that. Part two, uh, you're doing the first half of the questions. Do the further reading, catch up. Uh, don't forget we have the Google Classroom with everything already up there through the rest of the course. And we're well on our way to finishing this. And I hope your spells all go well. May you all have some wonderful understanding of yourselves and your own intuition and rely on yourselves when you are stumbling upon tools out in nature that can help you focus on being empowered, being in control of your fate, and living your best life. So mote it be, and from everyone here at the Coven of the Open Mind, blessed be.